What's up, everybody? I'm uh, Jerry with Black Candle Games, and tonight I will be hosting a nice little gaming roundtable discussion with these fine gentlemen. Um, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Rob, go ahead and start, and we'll go around. Sure, I'm Rob Schwab. Uh, I run uh, the company who makes Shadow of the Demon Lord, and currently Shadow of the Weird Wizard, uh, hopefully your new hotness. Yes, live now on Kickstarter. That's right. Chris, go ahead. All right. Hey, I'm Chris Primus, uh, founder and president of Green Redeem Publishing. Uh, you may know me as the designer of Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay 2nd Edition, uh, the Dragon Age RPG, Fantasy Age RPG, which has just had a 2nd Edition released a few weeks ago. All right. Steven? And I'm uh, Stephen Randy McFarlane, currently the lead game designer over at The Glimmering, uh, a 5e compatible, I guess we can say Dungeons and Dragons compatible now, after all of that weirdness. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, before that, um, uh, let's see, I worked at Paizo and Wizards of the Coast, working on such uh, wonderful games as Pathfinder and Dungeons and Dragons. All right. Um so I think first thing we want to jump into tonight is probably just talk about like design process. What what is it? What is your process like? Do you have any, um, I would say, rituals or certain constraints that you put yourselves in or through or anything like that when you are starting to work on a game? Or I know that there's both scenarios where maybe you're working on a brand new game versus working on a game that's already established. Maybe those things look different. So I guess, you know, whoever wants to take it first, just what, what is your, uh, what's your overall process like? Um, I usually start with research. Uh, even if I'm doing a brand new game, um, I guess it's my history training from graduate school or something, but, um, I, uh, I'd like to kind of scope out the territory, make some goals, um, outline, um, and then, uh, you know, start with the core, you know, the core mechanics of the game and, and build around that. Um, the actual like design part is like, uh, <laughs> requires the delicate psychological manipulation of myself to get into a zone where I can just uh, write and not be thinking of other things um, or being distracted or whatever. Um, so that's, um, <laughs> that was a learned skill. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not like Rob. Rob just wakes up in the morning and is like, do, 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 do. And uh, uh, I've never been that way. <laughs> yes, Rob's a machine. <laughs> Used to be We're more of a broken down um, uh, Ford Pinto. Uh, I think my process is, is sort of similar. Usually, what I'll do if I've got a couple, I'll have I work in two different zones. Uh, one is just pure game setting concepting. Like I got one where I've got a game that's been kicking around in my head about having being a you're all playing cats and you have to escort grandma across a field. I don't know what else goes on in this game, but I like the idea of this that. The big snowy field, there's this old lady and your characters have to escort her along to do something. I don't know. Maybe she's going to feed you or whatever. Uh, but you, but uh, so I've got those kinds of things. I've got a whole big file of all this nonsense uh, that goes back to when I was even thinking about uh, the Osmosis Jones role-playing game. But I think mm -hmm. Evil Genius has already gotten the jump on that one by now. Uh, but uh, the other end of it, though, is I will usually lock myself into a corner of the bar uh, when I can still, you know, when it, you know, there's not a pandemic raging, um, and I will, I will uh, usually just work on my phone and build uh, game systems. I've got about a dozen just sitting around. Really, you can do that on your phone. Yeah, that seems amazing to me. It's just a well, note. I've got those buttons. They mm -hmm. correspond to letters. You can sit there. My phone has a special thing where it can uh, register and interpret interpretive dance. And so I will usually just sway and move in front of my phone, and then it just records it all. Nice. See what the D12 looks like and moves. There's a, a scene in The Wire where two detectives are uh, examining a you know, crime scene, 
And the only thing they say back and forth to each other is the word fuck in different intonations. <laughs> and I imagine uh, that's what Rob's oh, yeah. are like. <laughs> yep, 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 yep. <laughs> I, I, I think I always um, start with the very simple premise of who is who's this game for, right? And so whether I'm working uh, with a client or I'm coming up with something uh, on my own, I'm like, who's gonna who's gonna play this game? I tend to like to design games that I want people to live in for a long time. You know, um, I think part of it is just because I love those kind of games. And another thing is, well, you know, I worked on D&D and Pathfinder, and those are games that people just, you know, they sort of live in. And so even when it comes to doing a new edition or a new iteration or something, it's like, who who is my end user? Um, am I am I heading towards kids? Am I heading towards old grognards? And I, am I trying to hit that thing in, in between? And so, and once I sort of if I've got the time and inclination, I'll do a, a kind of a form of persona modeling. Who are my main sort of sort of players there? Or if not, I'll just get this, you know, general sort of, you know, kind of avatar thought of my who's going to who's going to like this? Who's going to like this? Who's going to think this is absolutely total garbage? Um, OK, throw away the garbage, you know, for the most part, unless yeah, I'm going for garbage uh, folks, which I might be. I don't know. So, so a similar sort of process, uh, probably somewhere in between uh, Chris and, and Rob, I tend to wake up in the morning, go through my morning routine, come down, check messages, watch local news, start working. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't really need to get in the groove, but uh, I also find myself not producing the, the massive uh, uh, of material that, that, that Rob does. Um, Although I like, I think I'm getting closer, but I'm probably not. Well, in my defense, uh, I have been trained on uh, imposter syndrome and fear. No oh, fair. Uh, that those those <laughs> just ejected into my body in, in vast quantities. You know, like when I'm having, if if I get to to actually work, uh, I will normally have uh, I'll, I'll work for the length of one album, whether that album is 28 minutes long or an hour and 14. And then I'll go do choring or tend to cats or read a book or do something else. Yes. And then I come back. And so I kind of constantly trying to break up that day because there is, you know, when I started out, I could sit in front of my desk for 10 hours and, mm -hmm. and get twitchy and, 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 and I can't do that anymore. And that's too much. That's understandable. Yeah. My, my follow-up question was going to be <clears throat> as far as process, like environment, you guys kind of touched on it, both Rob mentioning the bar and stuff like that. But I'm always curious, like myself, for, for me, I can't, like, I need to remove myself from my normal, like setup. I need to go get a coffee or sit in out nature or just like in a different fucking room in my house because I just, I can't, I get distracted. So like, do you guys have the same, like, do you have to externalize from your, day to day or are you comfortable right where you're always at uh well so i'm in my office right now and this is where i tend to do more like business stuff because i'm the president of the company and there's right a lot of that um and then when i actually want to write i usually go into the bedroom and uh and pull out my laptop and work in there um that partially has to do with the fact that this office faces west so as it gets to be three four o'clock in the afternoon the, the sun starts warming the room up yeah. <laughs> but i just i don't know i find it a uh, less distracting environment i guess okay um and then i guess you know so like on a on a conceptual basis you you conceptualize a game and you've got mechanics down you've done some world building my first question is at what point do you start testing and then we can ask more questions about testing in general but i would say how far along do you guys get before you're like i'm going to show this to somebody probably somebody close and not just post it you know online uh but at what point would you say in your design process do you go from conceptualizing to moving into actually testing your game with somebody that's not you. Well, that's really, we, 
you know, uh, up until the last few years, uh, I typically worked with teams. And so it was very common for us to throw stuff back and forth uh, uh, to one another. And so almost immediately you throw out ideas, we, you test out ideas and everything else. Um, in the last few years, it's been a little bit different. I've been, you know, uh, even before, prior to the pandemic, I decided to work for her home and work for myself and, and, and everything else. And, and, and I'm really not afraid of like, yeah, here's the thing I think that's kind of half baked, but you know, you know, throw it out, tell me what you think. And, you know, people say, I like this, I like that. You know, then you, you get the folks who, who always want to put their stink on it and everything else, but that's just, that's just part of the thing. So as far as sort of small general kind of concepts, I think you could throw those out just about immediately realize you're going to get um, a, sort of a, a, a chorus of suggestions um, uh, and take all those suggestions at heart and then just do whatever the fuck you want anyway. <laughs> that was good. that was going to be my follow up. How many of those suggestions do you mm. genuinely take, and how many of them do you hear and go, "That's cool," and then you keep on what you're already on? It depends on how smart the suggestions are. Like <laughs> you know, it, it, I know that sounds kind of kind of wishy washy, but there's all there's all sorts of manner of suggestions. Like I'll, one of the suggestions I get all the time is like, "You should change this word, Stephen," because you know, and just fill in the blank. And usually when I center on a word, um, I'm pretty, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that word. Uh, and so a lot of those things I'm like, yeah, I don't know. But if there's a, if, if the argument is, is particularly smart, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely reconsider it. it. It's how insightful some people just say, you should change this. And I'm like, well, that's not an argument. That's just a suggestion, right? This is a creative endeavor. You can do basically kind of whatever you want with it. But if somebody has a really well thought out reason why I should change my mind, I'm more likely to be swayed by that because I like good arguments. Makes sense. Well, I tend to um, work by myself um, until really the core of the game has gelled. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially it's like me finishing my thought, like before I get other thoughts. <laughs> um, so, you know, I will usually have like the core mechanic, character creation, you know, this sort of stuff enough to create some characters um, and then start hacking things around, even if it's just, you know, not even like really playing an adventure, but just, you know, like having a fight, seeing how it feels, uh, that kind of stuff. And um, there are people who are really good at giving feedback. And then there are people who want to design the game themselves. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's very valuable finding people who can give good feedback. Um, and that, but you know, it's like if someone has a good or better idea about something, I'm happy to change things around. That's why we test anyway. Yeah, I think I'm similar. I will uh, usually have a good chunk of the game plotted out. Uh, I know with Demon Lord, I had uh, the guts of that game pretty well hammered out, hammered down. Started opening up to what I would with the alpha testers, which were friends, and then eventually took it on the road. And even like even like before I made the the full at a convention, here's the game. I mean, it was 24 hours before I made a fairly substantial change to how that game played, just based on you know those epiphanies from. You run the game 20, 30 times, and you've had other people run the game. You get their feedback. Uh, Weird Wizard has been different, um, and I think it's because I've been working on it for so long. I've been telling people it's been five years, but it's really been longer since it's been sitting in my head. Uh, and so the, when I the, when I took it to playtesters uh, about two years ago, uh, the game looks completely different now than it did then. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there were, uh, during that process, Tim jumped in and he and I were hammering out details and moving away from some of the initial ideas. We're moving back to what the game was originally supposed to be. And so it's gone through, I think I would probably say 60 iterations from the time I, from version one, all the way up to its present form. And to be clear, you said 60 is in six zero. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But, and, 
I would lose my mind if I had to do well, it. Well, I, I mean, some some iterations, you know, and I kind of definitely went through this with, well, well, just about every game, but, you know, Delve, my constant sort of work in progress thing is it's amazing how such a little change can create a new iteration. It's, it's you know, for, for instance, to me, once I get sort of the core ideas out there and I start having people play it, um, watching people play, like the, the best kind of play testing I found is watching other people play it, not running the game myself. I know how that, that goes, mm -hmm. but actually watching other people play it, see where the GM struggles, see where the players struggle and everything else. Um, and uh, luckily I've been able to do that with, with quite a few of the games and that will make you go back and say, okay, we've got to tweak that. And sometimes those iterations having a rolling effect all through the game. And so at least as, as someone who's been, not paying attention as close as I want, but somewhat paying attention to uh, Shadow of the Weird Wizard, it, a lot of the iterations that I think Rob's talking about starts with something that seems seemingly small, but then you've got to propagate it yeah. all through the game itself. Mm -hmm. And when you're working on a huge, I mean, this game is, I think, probably about 700, 750 pages between the two books, somewhere around there. Uh, it, 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 it's It's not... This is a big mistake I keep making is that I will design a big game and then I'm not done and I'm then having to make these changes and they spider web through the whole thing. Yeah, there's like a ripple effect. The mm -hmm. most uh, one of the more frustrating or vexing aspects of the recent that I recently ran into was that for the very long time I had decided that I was going to stick with zones with Weird Wizard. There were going to be zones, 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 zones all the way through 45. 50 iterations of this game, it still zones. And then what I found was that as I'm getting playtester feedback, people are demanding more and more information, more precision for zones. And I realized that I was, I was writing these super complicated rules to manage mm -hmm. zones in a way that would satisfy all the different kind of people that were out there, mm -hmm. when really what they just want is permission to just ignore hard measurements. Right. And it's and it's far easier to have the hard measurements in place and then just say just ignore it and give them some guidelines about how to do that. I uh, warned you. You did. You did. <laughs> and, but you know, I was I, I was convinced. And I, you know, I don't. It's yeah. It's I, I I'm I'm a full believer that zones have some interesting things, but I they don't. I don't. I'm not convinced that they work for really big games mm -hmm. with lots yeah. of moving parts. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Weird aside about zones, I've played two games created by um, other game designers within the last uh, few months, and both of them have been miniature games. And they both used measurements, but really wanted zones. Like, in fact, the, the, the game itself had zones, and they're like, oh, you can move six inches until you reach this point. And then that's, and I'm like, yeah, that's just a zone, dude. And I found both times when I'm like, so why aren't you just using zones? Um, both of them look, looked at me like I just slapped their toddler upside the head. Like, <laughs> and, and so, yeah, the, the, it, it's amazing that how just the idea of measurements and movements in a game can, can not only be so hard to design to get that right balance, but how many people have sort of preconceived notions, uh, you know, even e even these two designers, they just looked at me like I was nuts. And I'm like, you're already using zones. You've you, you've got these kind of stops. This is just a zone. But um, a lot of times, uh, you know, th those kind of things, once you've got them set in your head, um, are you, you really need the sort of, you know, smack upside the head with the, the board to kind of see it and, and move forward. Um, that's why I wake up every morning and smack myself uh, with the board. <laughs> Hopefully I can see it earlier. Well, that was going to be my next question. I was going to ask you guys about, <laughs> I was going to, no, not the smacking. I was going to ask abuse. you guys about the, um, about iterations in general. And I think I kind of already know Rob's answer based on, but my question was going to be how many iterations is your stopping point? Like how, how many takes does it take before you're like, all right, fuck it, I've got to pick this and we're going to run with it and I'm not going to look at this again at all. And I think the answer is probably, there's probably not any one definitive stopping point because of subsystems and so many things that might change. It's just, 
Yeah, I mean, I do less iterations and more just like constant tinkering. So, you know, like when the final thing comes together, I'm not like, oh, well, you know, it took me 12 versions uh, because I'm noodling with little things the whole time. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if I can answer that question. Um, well, and I think the real answer is, especially when you're dealing with a game that's going to be published, it's it's what what's the publishing deadline right mm -hmm. and, uh, i mean because uh as as you can see through various role playing games and other kind of games games aren't finished they're just abandoned for a period of time you know in order to get people out there and play it and everything else and of course then you know uh, players change your player base changes you're going to want to come back in and and tweak things and and sort of you know fix the things you saw in the past and have new ideas and whatnot so yeah, it's well when you when you gotta put it in a book and sell it to people, right? You you abandon it and you go, I I hope I got everything, and knowing you didn't. Yeah. So in some games, you can totally tell that they just stopped at a time and then published. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't have to name names. Um, no, we don't. So die. I want to jump a little bit further back to the 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 feedback when we first mentioned getting feedback from players and I just have a question because I feel like I see this I feel like I see this everywhere I feel like I see it with video games with tabletop games with any kind of game right we're all gamers the line between being a person who plays games and being a person who makes games is, is literally nothing you just have to go one day I think I'm going to make a game and then technically you're a game designer right so like <clears throat> not really but you know people do you think that a lot of times when you get feedback gamers say things like oh well i like this game but i wish it did this and then when you ask them why they kind of don't know the answer they're just like mm -hmm. i want your game to have this feature from this other game that i like and then you're like okay but this game isn't that game and there's a reason why we consciously either moved away from or whatever like do you find a lot that like sometimes you get feedback from people and they say that they want something but they don't really know why they want it or is yeah. that just me being old and grumpy? I, I think that's people in general. People want things and they don't know why they want them. Um, and, and that, of course, comes in the game because game design seems to be, and I think we were all sitting there at one period of time when we were playing a game and it's like, man, I'd like to be able to make a game. How the hell do you do that? Um, I know a big awakening to me was the the first publishing of blood bowl where they actually talked about the process of designing that game on a page in the back. And I was like, Holy shit, this is work, right? It's not just magic. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so yeah, we all want things. We don't know why we want things. The idea of designing anything is to sit there and go, I want something to work in this way. How do I get it done? What's the best, best method to do it. And then once you get it done and you put it out there and it's a successful design, people, people just do it. And um, and then, you know, they'll ask for things and you'll get a product like Discord that does everything somewhat well. Right. But not the kind of things that you really want it to do as well as as it could be. And that's kind of a scattershot uh, sort of method to do it. But, yeah, you're always going to get that. Um, and I don't really. I, what do I say to those people? Um, so noted. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe the better question would be, is there, a, is there a way to ask for feedback around that? Like a, a way to word questions very specifically when you ask people, or I guess there's a question, would you just rather ask for general feedback when you're testing a game or are you, would you rather ask for kind of very specific? Like, what do you feel about this mechanic? How do you feel about this class? That type of stuff. I think there are two. I think uh, you benefit from both. Uh, the general feedback gives you good, good first impressions, but it also opens a door to inviting. I wish this was this way, and not have a. As we talked about, mm -hmm. not having a good reason other than the fact that that's what they would prefer. Um, and then, but it's harder to, if I find, to find people who are willing to just do the scut work of testing a very particular mechanic over and over and over again. I mean, if I had my way in endless resources, I would put uh, five gaming groups in a room and have them run combats at various level characters against every monster that's in the bestiary and see if they work the way I think they work. I have to trust that the math is right, but 
uh, there are going to be some weird combinations that will always crop up. And that's one of the nature, that's kind of the, the nature of making role-playing games that you never really can anticipate exactly how it's going to play. And if you do, it's a relatively boring game. Um, so I benefit from both. Uh, I don't, I get more general feedback than I do specific unless people are hyper invested in the feedback process, in which case then I get probably more than I want. Yeah. I, I uh, general feedback is most of it. Um, but I may have some specific questions that I want answered. Like I've changed this. How does that feel? Or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but for the most part, I, you know, I want a group to just take what's there and play with it. And, you know, <laughs> let me know uh, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, if they had a good time. Makes sense. I, I find general feedback to be interesting, but not as useful, right? Because basically what people are doing is telling me the contents of their head, which isn't to say that that's not important. Um, uh, specific feedback, you tend to have a better signal to noise ratio because usually specific feedback doesn't, when you're doing well, it doesn't come. When you've screwed something up, or somebody perceives that you screwed something up, that's where it comes in. It's all like, do you know that this is fucked up? And, and then you go, oh, it is. Okay, that's really good to know. The best kind of feedback comes from watching how people actually use the system, right? I, I mean, and it's it's kind of the one sort of frustrating part in, in our industry, even though there's ways to do it, is, is the best feedback you get is through actually watching people use the thing you've made. Mm -hmm. Um, because that's when all of the the design that you didn't intend sort of comes out, right? You know, right. it's when I worked at, at Wizards talking to the magic designers, the combos that come out in magic cards, like they try to design those in as much as possible, but they're always surprised by what the players actually sit there and find. And that's why you have band lists and, right. you know, and people are like, oh my God, what did we do? And it's that kind of game design that I find really kind of fun and interesting because it's, um, you know, because new and fun things come out of it yeah. and, and the players are actually helping you, you know, build a better mousetrap. Yeah, I, I totally, I mean, when you put a game in the hands of the players, they're going to find ways to break it that you never imagined. Like, Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Just putting it out there in the wild, letting them play it and then observing kind of, I think you guys have all kind of come to a general consensus that that's, the best scenario as far as you know watching um before we move on from testing i have one other testing question and it's just you, you know a little a little nugget here what would if you had to put it in a if you had to pick one thing that you think is the most important thing about testing your game whatever it is word it however you want what what do you think the most important thing about testing overall is does it work i mean that's that's really the fundamental question you're trying to answer um, is, does it work? Uh, and that's, you know, that, that, that's really what I want to find out through testing. And, you know, you can make little tweaks and, and you know, change things and whatever. But, um, you know, if you start a test and it's just like <laughs> not going, you know, then, then you know that you have to go back to the drawing board ignore yeah. ego that was where i was gonna go with too go ahead sorry and i i, I was gonna say leave your ego at the door but that also goes for the people that you're playing with right everything else is as soon as ego starts playing into the analysis you're bound to go and wrong and that's your own ego that's the egos of your play testers that's the egos of the person who oh i've seen this all before and everything else right and so taking ego out of the equation is one of the more difficult things you can do in testing, but it, it, it yields great results. Yeah, I, I concur. Uh, one thing I would say though is don't test until you're ready to test. Uh, I was recently in a situation where I was doing some design work on a core rule set and I was just sharing the file uh, before it was really complete. I was just sharing the file with typos and some rough, rough ideas and placeholders and I would get, you know, pages and pages of feedback. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not ready for that yet because I'm not even done with this. I'm not, I'm not even close to done with this chapter. Mm -hmm. And so what I ended up doing is having to go back and try to 
put out fires when I didn't even think that there was a fire really started because it wasn't mm -hmm. it wasn't done. It was this is just a, a rough prototype to see where my direction was going. Um, on the other hand, I look back at with uh, Weird Wizard. One of the things that we were monk I was monkeying with this game was trying to figure out a way to handle multiple attacks and do and attack maneuvers and all these other things. And I use a currency called attack dice. They became bonus damage dice, became something else, became, went back to bonus damage dice, and spending these extra dice of damage to do cool things. Like you want to shove a guy, so you do a little less damage to your attack, but you get to shove the guy away from you or trip this person or, or do all those other things. And then having to go round and round and round and round to make sure those numbers are right. To, to, because it is really hard to quantify what pushing a guy is going to do. Because that's not, that, that, what's, the, what's the weight of that? Right. And it's contingent on the circumstances, of course. Uh, but and it was there was a point where I just had to say, okay, this is it, and I'm not going to argue this anymore. I'm not going to sweat anymore. I'm, this is this is what we're going to do, and we we just plow through. And it's also great to control your ego because nothing like having 500 people tell you you're wrong, <laughs> <laughs> like being married to the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Zing. Okay. Um, okay, so moving on, and I guess probably the, the, the last big question of the night is, um, so like, how do you guys think about systems when you're designing a game? Do you design a system first? Like, do you, do you get an idea for, oh, you know, this would be cool to have, like Rob said, it would be cool to have like this dice pool or this mechanic that would be really fun for people, and then you kind of, you know, you design around that, or do you conceptualize uh, a, a world or kind of like a dare I say vibe that you're going for and then you plug mechanics into that like just I guess in general when you're thinking about any any system in a game that you have worked on you know past present or, or future like I guess this is a really kind of like out there question is a very floaty whatever but like I, I yeah how do you think about systems in a game so I yeah uh, I mean, I've done it both ways, right? You know, where it's like I've come up with uh, with some mechanisms and then, uh, you know, build from there. And other times it's world or theme or property in the case of licensed stuff. Um, actually, when we were doing um, Song of Ice and Fire role playing, which Rob was the lead designer on, um, we flew Rob and Steve Kenson out here to Seattle. Um, we had like a design summit where we just like talked over the books and, you know, what things from the books we want to make sure were in the system and how we could achieve that. Um, and that was a super useful exercise, or at least I felt it was. <laughs> Very much was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, it kind of, um, yeah, I guess it depends is a pretty unsatisfying answer, but it's... <laughs> Uh, certainly uh, to kind of build on that though there's, there's a sense where if you're building a big sandbox game like D, D or pathfinder or fantasy age you tend to have to cast a wider net and so i think system becomes more important than the setting or emulating elements the setting unless those settings or those elements are integral to uh the gameplay for example uh, i'd imagine if you were making a fantasy world that's a generic fantasy world but you've got a very clear idea about how magic works you know, this fantasy setting might have the typical kind of expressions of how we model characters in tabletop role-playing games, but then have a very, very specific uh, magic system that's kind of married to that world. Um, but then if I was going to make a game about, um, I don't know, your orphans, you wake up and you're, you wake up, you were an orphan, but you wake up and find out you are an orphan and you're in this really scary orphanage and there's this bizarre governess who wanders the hallways and you're trying to escape to find your way home, but there's a big mean dog outside and there's a lawnmower man that's out there too who's going to mess you up. And then you start thinking about this kind of game and then you start, well, what should I do to build this game? Well, these kids are orphans or school kids. So maybe what they should have would be report cards instead of character sheets. And so you start thinking about, all right, well, I've got PE and I can give them letter grades. What do the letter grades mean? And you start building out from that. You got the you get the concept of the of the setting and the story and the mood and all that stuff that kind of inform what you're gonna do with the with the guts. Makes sense, I guess. I don't know. 
I look forward to that game, bro. <laughs> no, it, it makes sense. And I guess, I guess to make my question a little less ephemeral, uh, to make this anecdotal, I, I had emailed Rob a couple weeks ago because I'm working on a game myself, and I was getting very hung up on um, core uh, ability scores. I had planned to use mm-hmm. four. I had this idea that I wanted to make a fifth, and I was, I was, I was obsessing over it for like three full days. So I, I emailed Rob, and he was like, "Maybe you're not thinking about this the right way. Like, you." it depends on what your players are going to do in your game. And he made a great example. I don't, I'm, I don't know if he'll remember it, but it was like, if I was going to make a caveman game and you were a caveman, I'd have like three abilities that was like throwing rocks at shit, jumping on people's backs and you know, whatever. And those would be my stats. And that actually, that really helped me. Cause I was very hung up on like, kind of like D and D braining what I was, what I was doing. And it helped me get out of it as far as just thinking about what I want the characters in my game to be doing. So yeah, there's a little more context. I should have said that first. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, yeah, a lot of it has to do with, you know, D and D and, and the games I like to make do cast wide nets, right? You not you not only need to have somebody who's great at doing caveman things you have to have somebody who's who's good at doing wizardy things and face you know uh the face of the party sort of things which has always been kind of challenging and every and whatnot and i think that's why you see a lot of those games have a bunch of ability scores but if you're doing something very simple and focused right you don't need as, as many abilities especially if it's going to be quick and fun and and, and it's not going to be it's going to be something you do every once in a while rather than i'm going to have a long-running campaign with this um also, you know, you, you take sort of the expanse, uh, and and I know Chris and I have talked about the the challenges of designing the expanse role playing game because that game is lethal, and you still have to be a hero in mm-hmm. this world where a thing can come tearing through your ship and just kill you. And I think, um, uh, you know, so you have to come up with interesting mechanics where it still meshes with the world that you're designing for. But you still give players a chance to let the story go on because if the, you know it's all like oh you know a whole bunch of uh, a bunch of shrapnel tore through your ship and that's the end of the campaign. Sorry, kids. Right? Yeah. <laughs> well, the game instead of using something like hit points uses uh, fortune, and mm-hmm. fortune um, in part represents your importance to the story. Right. So, you know, it's the guy next to you who's going to get hit by a railgun shot and turned into mist. <laughs> uh, but you, you know, you can use fortune in in various ways, and if you uh, run out, then you're in trouble. So yeah, I think in that way, story di- absolutely dictates it, right? I mean, Pathfinder, Starfinder, D and D, and everything else—they're basically, unless you play it. I, I played an interesting friend the a game that. Our, our friend Rob did, which is basically a dungeon survival game, and um, and you had uh, and he, and he just calls the game dungeon. And one of the things I've noticed is I was kind of expecting a normal dungeon crawl uh, of of typical sort of modern D and D. And oh my god, like anytime I wanted to do something, my my character just sucked, right? Like, or I had to make a very hard choice where, yeah, I lose power in order to do this. And I was like, Oh, this is a dungeon survival game. Right. And it's going to be, and it's, uh, you know, and, and there's been lots of arguments made that, you know, OD and D and even uh first edition D and D is actually a dungeon survival game. It's not really the kind of D and D that most people play now. Um, and so it's all like, yeah, what do you want the tone of the game to be? How do you want the story to progress? I think all and, 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 and how do you want the narration to explain all of this? Um, uh, I think those are probably the three important things you ask before you start figuring out what your core mechanics are. Okay. And, and since it got brought up, uh, I'll make the, the next question here. You guys mentioned the lethality in the expanse when you're, designing a game and you're weighing how lethal it is how do you guys feel in general about the concept of game balance in tabletop role-playing games and i say that because modern gamers uh, not modern gamers most people who have played you know any video game whether it's gauntlet or destiny or whatever any game there's a lot of talk about class balance I feel like it gets brought up a lot in the D&D world about, well, a wizard should be as powerful as a fighter because somehow 
the power level of your character is the perceived bar for fun that most people have. Like they can only have fun if they're doing damage or they're doing as much damage as another class. I'm not of the like mindset. Like I think it's interesting when characters do interesting, unique things and maybe one's way weaker than the other. So like, I guess when you're thinking about lethality in a game and you're designing it, how much thought do you put into this game needs to be balanced versus all of these classes need to be fun to play. Like, I'm sure that's a line that has to be walked. Luckily um, you've got a lot of levers to play with. Yeah. yeah. I think you can marry those two things in a way that enables both. I think that the question really is, I think that we get hung up on this idea of class parity or using D and D terminology as kind of this uh, unicorn that we're chasing down and really what a player really, really wants is the ability to feel special and interesting at least a couple of times in a game session. And that's one of the things that I think was the the undersung benefit of first and second edition was that you played a low level wit magic user, you're gonna have you're in for a really bad time. And the pay the trade-off is that you get to be really, really cool later, and the fighter really gets to suck and have a really bad time later. <laughs> um, but the interesting part about that was that it forced people to think about what their character could do within the constraints of that game. I may only have one hit point, but my God, if I can survive, I've got a story to tell for the rest of my life. And so, yeah, I think like it, it, even with uh, with Weird Wizard, it, like I have very I care. I did I did a lot of I did all the math, and it, there there is characters are balanced against each other and it was even further complicated by the fact that the idea of multi-classing as a concept is baked into the game so you're mixing and matching different chunks and putting them together in interesting ways and trying to make sure all that stuff works in a way that's satisfying it's extremely difficult and it's uh i would it's almost i would say it's probably not possible to achieve a level of balance that i think some folks want but at the same time you are getting you're guaranteed to be able to do something cool all the time that's that's my soapbox. Well, there is something cool to you know whether or not you're playing D and D or or some other game, and somebody comes up with the new subclass thing, and then they do something cool, and everybody goes, "Whoa, well, well, how'd you do that?" Right? I mean, there is a certain amount of fun not only for the person playing that uh, character, but for everybody else who sits there at the table who all of a sudden goes, "Oh, I didn't know you could do that!" Right? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think. I think it's much more important to to design options that people feel will excite them and make them want to play more rather than trying to find the impossible mathematic rigmarole that is going to make somebody on the internet go, oh my God, that's so balanced. <laughs> right. no, no one ever says that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I want um, people to feel like there's a reason that their character is there, you know, like if you can go up and like stab one goblin and then the wizard kills 10 goblins, you're like, do I need to be here? What am I, <laughs> what am I contributing? Um, I'm helping. Yeah. Yeah. So, but then the wizard can't do anything more for the rest of the time and mm -hmm. you get to stab everybody else to make sure the wizard doesn't die. I mean, depending on your rules. Perfect. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just, you know, I don't want anyone to feel like they got a bum character, you know, like, oh man, you know, like, like their character is just so much better than mine. Um, cause I mean, you're trying to get everyone to collaborate and have a good time together. So, um, you know, give people meaningful ways to contribute. I think it becomes more pronounced in situations where you're running role-playing games that have a where combat takes an, an outsized chunk of what you're doing, where your character is always up against death or you're having to make decisions on a round by round basis. Where, I mean, I think back to playing Traveler and it's like, I never looked at somebody and said, oh my gosh, your character is so much better than mine. You're just a string of numbers. It doesn't really matter. I I almost got killed as a merchant marine or or that's, you know, that's the story you should tell. But these characters, you're just telling the story because you're playing the characters and the personalities and you're skimming planets for their gases to fuel your ship. It's all fun stuff, but it's not like it's not like looking at uh, I'm going to pick on Diablo, uh, where you're playing the sorcerer and you've got somebody else in the group who's playing the barbarian, and you walk into a battlefield and you're crawling with demons everywhere, 
and the sorceress is plinking, 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 while the barbarian farts and lays waste to everything on the screen. <laughs> and you're gonna have a feel bad moment because the sorcerer is super nerfed. Um, I'm not sure where I was going with that, except to say that, yeah, I think it's become more pronounced in 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 fighty fight type situations. I guess you could probably have that same feel bad if you decide to play um, a knuckle dragger in like an intrigue based game and everyone's talking and playing cards or doing whatever the thing they're doing to manipulate their opponents that would be also be a feel bad but then again your that sh option probably shouldn't be available in such a game if that right. makes right in our uh modern age game um the way malcolm shepherd designed it uh there's three levels of lethality that you choose at the start of the campaign so it's gritty pulpy and cinematic so you know if you go at the at the gritty level like you're not going to be um racking up a bunch more health as you go up in level gunshot is always going to be scary to you <laughs> um you know pulpy is is more kind of rpg standard uh stuff and then the cinematic is the is the wahoo you know if con air yeah jump out of an airplane <laughs> with a machine gun in each hand uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, is there anything else you guys want to want to touch on? I think I've I've covered most of the stuff I wanted to. Don't ask Rob what he wants to touch on. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> do you guys yeah. do you guys want to uh, plug what you got going on? Like, tell people where to go find your find your stuff, what you do, what you're all about. Sure. All right, Chris, you talk first. You plug okay. first. <laughs> Carpe diem. Um, so, um, Fantasy Age Second Edition is is just out, um, <clears throat> and um, that originally came from the Dragon Age RPG, where essentially people were like, "I love these rules, but I'm not interested in the Dragon Age setting. So, could we have them separately?" And that was kind of the genesis of it. And then since then, we've done a bunch more games using uh, what's called the adventure game engine and each one of them has been customized or created new subsystems or design tech or whatever and so um, we were able to do with fantasy age second edition was to take a lot of the innovations of those other games and then kind of bring it full circle by bringing those into fantasy age and benefiting from the years of design and playing of all those games um so i think it is more robust um and uh, a lot of fun options in there for people um we also have coming up shortly a cthulhu awakens which is our adventure game engine take on the mythos um which um we really did try to be like this is not call of cthulhu with a different rule system you know this is us doing our version of the mythos. And so if you go in thinking you know everything, you don't, <laughs> you know, and the way the mechanics are are different. Um, and uh, it's a great book. Very oh, cool. Thank you. Yeah, we just raised the PDF to backers and it's going to print soon. Um, yeah, we've got Music Masterminds, our superhero game and lots of stuff. So you can go to greenreading.com uh, to look at our online store or follow us on Twitter at Green Renewed Pub or me is at Primus for as long as I'm on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Until it implodes. I tell you, every it's time I get that X now, now, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> All I could show more, but I'll stop. All right. Who's next? I guess I'll go. Uh, so right now, my my current main gig is uh, the Glimmering, which is a five E uh, system, basically published under now the Open uh, uh, Creative Commons Open License. Because why wouldn't you? And uh, and then we utilize. We've got an organized play system that utilizes such bad words as blockchain and digital collectibles and stuff like that. Uh, which actually solve a lot of problems uh, in organized play spheres that uh, I was trying to find solutions for in 2000. So 
if you want to boo me because it's it's that that's fine but uh you should check it out we've actually got a, a great group of people there who are playing games and and designing games and we're having a, a great deal of fun um i also did some development work for the gloomhaven rpg which just finished their backer kit campaign um uh really excited to see what people think about that i hear pathfinder second edition is getting a what are the, what is it called now um an up, it's not an update it's not a revision it's a enhancement i don't know what, what they're calling it. Yeah, using the orc license which uh that's going to be i haven't been paying a whole lot of attention to that every once in a while somebody sends me a question and like steven what do you think about this change i'm like i haven't taken a look at it but um well the best thing about that is they're finally splitting that 700 page rule book into two books which should have happened in the first place so yeah well i i remember when we were working on that book yeah and they were like okay steven here are and this is the kind of crazy stuff you get when when you work in game design so we want a core rule book with another ancestry another race another class a section on the game world we want the type to be bigger but we don't want the book to be any longer and i'm like that's not the way physics works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you're going to have to make a bigger book. Right. Um, yeah. and, and what it ends is, is, is being, uh, being a bigger book. Uh, but, um, so yeah, splitting that up and everything else, I put a lot of, uh, you know, uh, the, anybody who's interested in, in Delve, there's some shared DNA with Pathfinder second edition and Delve. Uh, I worked on both of those games at kind of the uh, same point in time. They've got some similarities and in, in, in the vast differences as well, but a very, I still work for, uh, do some work, freelance work for Paizo. And I hope that goes great guns. I'm also interested to see what Starfinder second edition is going to do, uh, being compatible with, uh, with the older games. So, um, while those things don't put money directly into my bank account, they are things that I'm proud of, and you should go take a look at and, and see if you like them. All right. Rob, tell us. Yeah, it's, so, right. Uh, I'm just going to tell you about Shadow the Weird Wizard. It's my new thing. Uh, it's the last project that I worked on with uh, Kim Mohan. Uh, it was a, it's a very important project to me uh, because it kind of uh, it best reflects the working relationship that Kim and I had. Uh, and it's kind of, this is my big attempt to honor him and his legacy. Uh, so that game is currently running on uh, Kickstarter. Uh, we funded really fast and we blew up the first day and now we're kind of in the, the still waters of the middle 20 days. Uh, so, uh, but you can get, at this point, if you back it, you're getting like an extra thousand pages of content on top of the core books by themselves. Uh, also until the end of this month, uh, Bundle of Holding is running two deals for the Shadow of the Demon Lord bundle and then also the Shadow of the Demon Lord Legacies. You can get a bunch of cool stuff for cheap. And then on drive through uh, all Shadow of the Demon Lord and Punk Apocalyptic products are 30% off until uh, the end of the Kickstarter. Uh, in addition to that, we're still putting out cool stuff for Demon Lord. Uh, we just released The Crawling Sea, which is a disgusting, dirty, filthy descent into madness and evil. Uh, it is... <laughs> Rob Schwab to 11. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, we also have, uh, we're wrapping up the Punk Apocalyptic missions. Tom Cataret is wrapping those up. And we have a bunch of other things also in the works too. So you follow, you find me on Facebook, uh, on X slash Twitter as Schwab underscore Ent. And then my website, which is schwabentertainment.com. Oh, yeah. We have two bundles of holding happening right now, two Blue Rose ones, one for the course oh, right. stuff and one for adventures. I don't know when people will see this, but uh, August 21st is when those. All right. Yep on it. Good game. Very cool, guys. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank right. you, Jerry, for hosting. Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Do it again sometime. 